Hello and welcome back. We discussed capitalism last week, so it's only natural. We now discuss its diametric opposite, its eternal foe, communism. So without further gilding the lily, let us delve into one of the most reviled and misunderstood political philosophies of our time. This was a difficult video to make. How do you define communism? Without straying into Marx, Lenin and invariably Stalin, how can you rationally discuss the good of communism without speaking to its negative implementation? How can you discuss the theory of communism without trying to address where it comes up short without unfairly denigrating it? In many ways, this is as much a critique of the idea of communism as it is a defence of it. I hope to be as even-handed as possible in addressing the very real good that communism has to offer whilst also addressing the very real consequences that arise because of it. As ever, it shall be to you, dear watcher, to make your judgement on the strength of its arguments and the weakness of its points. Sadly, I am not a communist. Despite my sympathy towards its leanings and my belief that the society of tomorrow will eventually trend towards some form of communism, I do not believe we are there yet and my criticism will likely reflect this. So please bear in mind my own bias when thinking on this. So, warnings aside, what is communism? Communism's core theory is pretty simple and it shares the root logic with socialism. The workers create the wealth, therefore the means of production should be controlled by the workers. In addition to socialism, the means of consumption should also be determined by the people. It is both halves of a statement, from each to their ability, to each depending on their need. Bear in mind this is an inherently collectivist tradition that views people as the sum of their society. It views individualism through the prism of if you break the bonds holding down society, you break the bonds holding down the individual. But before we go into its modern iterations, it is worth examining proto-communism that has sprouted up throughout history. One of the earliest implementations that I know of is Christian communism. It is not something you will ever hear the mainstream denominations of Christianity speak of, at least not explicitly. Indeed, to much of Christianity in the United States, what I've just uttered is an ungodly anathema. If you contextualise the Bible, and what Jesus, or as he would have been known in the language he spoke, Aramaic, Yeshua bin Yosef, is reputed to have said through the Gnostic Gospels, the Dead Sea texts and other attributed sources, what we in fact find is the very picture of a communist revolutionary, much in the sense of the infamous revolutionaries of the early 20th century. Were Jesus alive today, he would perhaps have been portrayed very similarly to Che Guevara. This before you turn off in outrage is not a very muddied reading. Jesus from his own words appended the lenders in the temple, raged against society's inequity, spoke of how hard it is for the rich man to enter heaven and spent his time with what was considered the dregs of society, the poor, the vulnerable, the sex workers, those who were shunned and rejected and powerless. When he fed on the mount, people shared their food, they broke bread together and indeed this legacy of proto-communism survives to this day. After all, what are monasteries but religious communes? Brothers or sisters who live a life of togetherness where they share all resources and live as aesthetics in pursuit of something greater. Does that not sound like a commune? Even if we are to change the axle holding the wheels together, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus as quoted tends to be far more towards the radical appending of the economic order in favour of those who are lesser off than he is of preserving the status quo. This might be something that is controversial, but this core is very present in all three of the Abrahamic faiths. The motivation underpinning communism is different of course. Within religious communism, it's about giving everything up and providing equally so that all can equally share the bounty of the supreme creator and bask in the light of salvation. In communism, it is about sharing the bounty of our labour so that all can enjoy the benefits of the nation. 
The point of this being that throughout history, there have been times when the dominant current narrative of private enterprise has given way to the common good and common enterprise. It often doesn't last beyond a generation or two, as we saw with the early Christians, but it is still there. It isn't a new invention or something that was invented out of the blue in the early 20th century or the late 19th. One of the biggest misconceptions about communism is that it believes in the seizure of private property, which isn't strictly true. Communism doesn't believe in abolishing personal possessions, and in some forms, even allows limited ownership of land. It does, however, talk of controlling the means of production, distribution, and consumption. So this removes from the market enterprises which extract resources, transform those resources into goods, and sell those goods to people. So you can keep your teddy bears and worry more about your job's owner, who will swiftly find themselves out of a business. Communist theory, after all, holds that those that do the producing should determine how their labour goes and from there should have diction over distribution and consumption to ensure that all needs are met. In theory, this is sound. In practice, this has seldom worked. This is not because the market concept is inherently efficient and the central distribution model inherently inefficient. It would be more accurate to say that the market is inherently inefficient and the central distribution model inherently efficient. However, the market is far more agile in reacting and anticipating to customer needs, thus meaning that it gives the appearance of central distribution being more inefficient as the central system is always playing catch up. What this has resulted in is the absurd situation where an inherently efficient system becomes inherently inefficient because it fails to account for changes in demand. And that is the Achilles heel of all iterations of communism. There has yet to be invented a system which can help the command economy properly anticipate and react to the fluctuations in demand in a way that remains efficient in both its production and its usage of resources. But let's expand more on that command economy. The command economy is different from economic planning, despite what conservatives would have you believe. Neither are inherently part of communism, but often accompany it. The planned economy uses heavy regulation to try to iron out the fluctuations in capitalism and ensure a more even distribution of resources. This was seen to great effect in most of the post-war economies and during the Second World War, where four-year plans were all the rage. It attempts to, as it says, plan out the next few years by anticipating the needs of the populace and adjusting regulations and quotas correspondingly. This doesn't preclude independent production, it just gives a baseline of needs it expects to be met. Most countries today use some form of economic planning to try and keep things moving steadily. It gives greater tools and levers for the principal controllers of parts of the economy to better react to market fluctuations and crises. A command economy depends upon a centralised input that issues orders to a production source to fulfil a need it believes is present. This inherently precludes independent production. It controls the entire production chain from resource extraction to good distribution. There is no scope at all for private or individual enterprise to find a niche or exploit a gap in the market. All is divined from the centre and all is distributed from the centre. In certain situations, this system is the best way to develop an economy. For example, the Russian Empire prior to the 1917 October Revolution was an agrarian feudal state. By 1945, the Soviet Union was one of the industrial powerhouses of the world after going through several centuries worth of economic development in three short decades. It would be remiss of me not to mention the enormous human cost of this rapid development, but this is less about the command economy and more the incompetence of theorists attempting to govern. 
the command economy was central to this rapid development, and when it comes to large national projects, it is possibly one of the most efficient forms of resource and labour allocation. However, where the command economy falls down is its inability to adjust to short and small changes that would not justify retooling the entire production chain for smaller efficiencies. The problem is that large innovation depends on hundreds of smaller innovations first taking place. A good example of this is the iPhone, in that Steve Jobs found many smaller technologies developed by the US military and put them together for a groundbreaking product. Under a command economy, this would not have been possible because the smaller innovations needed may not have been made or independent minded people given the ability to experiment with them. Another problem inherent to the command economy is the tendency towards an all encompassing bureaucracy, which often can be abused and fall into totalitarianistic authoritarianism. Now I get the tankies won't like hearing that, but it is a fundamentally dangerous idea to give a group of people that much power over not only production but consumption, because to accurately forecast the needs of the people, those bureaucrats require accurate and often extremely personal information. This is very similar to the concept of surveillance capitalism. Unlike a market economy, this information is a vital component of the command economy, and unlike a market economy, or at least the theory of a market economy, the risk is not private. The risk is public, and one small misstep can crash the system. This is why the Soviet Union struggled so much at ensuring an efficient production of goods. Moving away from the economic side of things for a moment, we step onto the threshold of the largest shadow over communism, Marx. Now, Marxist theory is incredibly dry, incredibly complicated, and full of jargon and contempt. One of my biggest criticisms of Marxist theorists is that they often despise one another more than the capitalists they profess to hate. There is no attempt to make the theory understandable or palatable, and frequently has gatekeepers who try to shoot down the newcomers by telling them that if they haven't read one text or another, they are no true Marxist, and therefore have no idea what they're talking about. An obvious flaw is present in their cunning plan. Only true believers will spend such an amount of time chasing this often impenetrable vicious soir verbiage resulting in the death of popular appeal. Optics matter, communications matter, and you cannot simply depend upon the rightness of impenetrable arguments if you do nothing to communicate them first. But now on to Marx, and Marx's theory itself. Marx's ideas must first be seen for what they are, a critique of capitalism in the late 19th century. The situation and circumstances in which Marx wrote were a time of great social, economic and political upheaval. That which we have now was simply unthinkable to late 19th century thinkers, and it is always important to bear that in mind when discussing the theories and ideas of people from so very long ago. Marx's primary idea was that class trumps all, that society does not have a middle class, there is only the people who work for a living and the people who live off that profit. The belief itself is simple, that capitalists will always seek to exploit the worker, or as he says the proletariat, and will always try to extract profit from the labour of the underclasses, something he believes is inherently unjustifiable. Those that do the production and create the good should own the profit of that good. A small tangent, but an offshoot of this concept is present in Harry Potter of all things, in how the goblins view ownership of goblin made goods, chiefly that the good belongs to the creator and is only lent to the wizard. However, if we want to discuss the goblins of Harry Potter, we also need to discuss anti-Semitic coding, and that is a whole video on its own. Another key point of Marx is that the capitalist will always seek to divide the worker and will use an expanding base of workers to do so. They use the law of scarcity, as in that which is rare is worth more. The more workers there are, the cheaper labour becomes. This concept is why the working classes are always fed a diet of racism and hatred against the other. 
most Marxists would point to the current immigration debate across most European countries and the United States as case in point here. One key aspect of Marxist critique is the concept of structural contradiction. Adam Smith mentioned this concept in a different manner to Marx. Smith believed that profit falls as a result of increased competition in the market driving down prices, whilst Marx attributes this to a structural issue that stems from the instincts of capitalism itself. Marx believed that the value inherent to a good stems from the physical labour involved, and capitalism always seeks to marry technology to production to greater improve the efficiency of said production. However, as the law of plenty shows, the more production there is, the lower in value of said product, and when this is tied to the lessening need for physical workers, so too declines the profit gained from that physical production, and so, as the profit decreases and workers become redundant, then this sows the seed for a socialist or communist revolution in which the means of production are collectivised to prevent widespread penury. Naturally, this assumes that value is divine from physical labour, which isn't necessarily true. This was made clear in multiple critiques of Marx's work in the immediate decades after publication by all and sundry, from Marxists right the way across to capitalists. However, despite being wrong, it does touch on something that perhaps does hold some valid points, albeit in a limited form. As a company profits during its initial growth stage, unless it begins to create new products, it quickly begins to stagnate as it reaches a saturation point. To keep up its profit margin, it then begins to attempt to extract profit from the same level of production by raising prices, slashing wages and cutting back on quality. Often, this is done at the behest of shareholders or the next generation of owners who seek to increase their profit margins because most only care about the bottom line. It would also be fair to mention that this concept of slashing wages is leading to the economic system's downfall in the present, though it would be more accurate to frame it within the boom-bust cycle of Keynes rather than the revolution of Marx. Slashing wages causes a precipitous drop in aggregate demand as disposable income disappears and without disposable income, people do not buy goods and so demand falls and companies go bust. Marx's suggestion for fixing the inherent issues with capitalism often veer from the materialistic to the wildly idealistic. The concept of a dictatorship of the proletariat has been wildly misused and given way to dictators and strongmen who pervert the very ideals of communism in pursuit of their own agenda. Enter Stalin, a brutal and tyrannical dictator who at every turn violated the fundamental principles of communism and its very intention, liberating the proletariat from exploitation. This has become a tendency in communist states, as people are simply not used to or equipped to make the decisions that are required on a day-to-day -day basis. When your company goes from a system where the CEO makes the strategic decisions to a company where workers make the strategic decisions overnight, you end up in a situation where people with no prior training or understanding are now attempting to divine a route forward. This has frequently led to catastrophe. Like with early stage capitalism, this requires time to work out the issues and mitigate the vast human costs. However, such time is rarely afforded to communist nations, as the more capitalist nations have attached morality to capitalism over the past century, and therefore see it as a moral necessity to eliminate communist nations wherever they are found. The United States and the United Kingdom, the two dominant hegemons of the past two centuries, have always acted to stamp out these views wherever possible. This is because communism runs contrary to Britain's imperialism or the United States' worship of capitalism. From invading post-revolutionary Russia to toppling communist and socialist governments through covert means right the way up to the modern day, the history of communism's failures cannot be told without the story of sabotage, hostility and vicious assault from other nations. This lack of security always lends itself to dictators as established centuries past by the example of Rome, which transferred power from the Senate to a dictator for the survival of a state. 
communists often act in a similar fashion as a revolution must always be protected. That notion of the revolution being protected is also misused by communists, often to tragic effect. Where they attempt to protect the legitimacy of a revolution by cracking down on criticism or failure of highly theoretical concepts which have not translated into reality well. This tendency is also present in capitalist systems, often through more subversive ways than the communists' more overt attempts. This has led to millions of deaths as people have starved when the official figures said that the grain silos were full, as nobody had the courage to point out the failure of the system. Capitalism itself has done similar, often in different languages, such as when talking about the undeserving poor or starving non-compliant colonial subjects such as the British in India. Unlike capitalism, communism has simply never had the time to develop past these highly theoretical concepts because it is frequently stamped out. Does this mean that communism is not a good idea? Not necessarily. The idea that human beings should be motivated by more than their own self-interest is an inherently good idea, even if it is practically utopian in its hope. The reason for this is simple. We live in a finite world with finite resources. The model that capitalism encourages of endless perpetual growth built upon the consumption of those finite resources is inherently doomed to failure. As we see with global warming, it is threatening our very existence as a species. Therefore, unless we pursue a more sustainable concept centred around mutual and symbiotic growth over exploitative growth, we will simply disappear into the annals of time. A cautionary tale for those that rise out of our demise. Communism is, however, incredibly naive in its outlook in that it presumes that people born under capitalism who have lived their entire lives under capitalism and have a historical legacy in their family of capitalism are in any way ready to not only live but flourish under a system that is the very antithesis of everything they have ever known. Even though communism may lead to greater liberation in some aspects, as women in East Germany found greater autonomy, both sexual and otherwise, than women in West Germany, most people in East Germany, like most people in most communist states, are simply not ready or able to embrace the mindset required to flourish in a communist system. It requires a perception unlike anything that can be found in a capitalist society. On a philosophical level, the whiplash that people feel when transitioning from a capitalist system to a communist one is akin to someone finding a time machine, appearing in the Bronze Age and attempting to explain 21st century liberal democracy. Those people could not hope to understand liberal democracy properly, let alone implement it, and this is the harsh truth for why revolutionary communism nearly always fails and will continue to fail even if the US left it well alone. For communism to become a viable form of government without descending into tyranny, militarization and eventually collapse, it requires a significant shift in the collective mindset of people and in our cultural consensus in how we view ourselves, our role in society and the very conception of what it means to live. That endeavour will take decades upon decades of transitionary stages, something few communists are able to appreciate or even fully comprehend. Such is their zeal for communism, and I'm perfectly sure that about a million tankies are now ready to shoot me for that. Communism is at its core the philosophy of the hopeful, the purview of the optimistic and the religion of the downtrodden, and yet its implementation frequently results in hopelessness, pessimism and the worship of a man over the celebration of human liberation, and the consequences of those failures echo down history and will continue to reverberate until we as a people are ready to take the next step forward in our continual development. On that heady heady note, thank you for listening and I hope to see you next week where we'll discuss liberalism.